Giacomo Lentini, Giacomo da Lentini to be specific, is largely unknown to the world today in a broader sense. But he was the most influential poet writing in the early to mid 13th century in Italy. And one aspect of his work uh, largely remade Western literature. And that is the invention, as he is credited with, of the sonnet. Uh, we don't know that much about the man himself. Uh, he, he lived and worked in Sicily primarily uh, between roughly the, the early 1200s to the, to like around 1266, we think. Scholars are certainly unsure. We don't actually know if his name is Giacomo or Jacopo. Uh, these are all mysteries to history, quite frankly. He was nicknamed the notary because of his work in the court of the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II and his son Manfred, the last two kings of Sicily. And uh, he, his work uh, was considered leading within, uh, within that court. That court celebrated the Sicilian language, among other things. It's uh, the Sicilian dialect of, uh, of Italian was for a while the most prominent vernacular of that tradition. And coming out of uh, Latin, it had a, uh, a, a real claim for a while there uh, to become the national language of Italy up until Dante came along and decided it should be Tuscan, where he was from. But uh, Lentini is credited with uh, leading this group, which is a remarkable, uh, remarkable production. We still have around 300 or so poems from them in all forms. Uh, we believe Lentini's uh, total that we have, is, some of them are a little bit uncertain, uh, total somewhere in the uh, around 40, which is a not bad little percentage of a 300 total for uh, an entire group of people. The, uh, the group worked largely within the French troubadour tradition, but they took that courtly poet uh, style of Provençal and uh, made some moderations to it. They, for one thing, they tended to idealize uh, women a little bit. They softened the sometimes harsh uh, per, uh, portraits of them that could show up in the troubadour uh, uh, tradition, where the serving uh, of, of the lady was often so uh, unrequited and could often stir up some feelings of hostility, if not jealousy and resentment. Uh, the, um, uh, but that notion of the court was very important, especially in, quite frankly, uh, uh, Frederick's and, and Manfred's uh, reigns, they were developing Sicilian as a, uh, a, as a primary artistic language in contradistinction to, let's say, Latin. Uh, Frederick especially had a very hostile relationship with the papacy, and Manfred actually was uh, died at the Battle of Benevento, where uh, where he was taking up arms against the forces of the Pope. Uh, this was back when the Pope could have an army. Um, well, it was associated with, uh, but you see in that a kind of uh, Italian identity that is pushing back against the power center of the Vatican, a, an attempt to try and uh, create a secular, um, a secular culture for, uh, for Italy and for Europe at the time. And, uh, and uh, Giacomo de Lentini was right in there. Doesn't mean that he was at all uh, sacrilegious or anything, but he had, uh, you could see, reflected in his work some of that attempt. We don't actually have any of his poems in the original Sicilian. Uh, all we have are their ultimate translations into Tuscan, which is different, um, similar in many respects, but, you know, it's a dialect. It's going to have little differences. And so even just you know, different versions, different editions that you see of the poem uh, that you can find just online 
uh, will have little slight variations here and there with some of the wording and, and phrasing. Uh, not terribly much. Um, uh, Lentini was, as I said, extremely celebrated during his lifetime, recognized as a, a as a master poet. Uh, just a generation or two later, Dante would uh, celebrate him, uh, memorialize him in the Purgatorio, uh, I think Purgatorio 24, uh, as a uh, as a forerunner to the Dolce Stil Novisti, to these uh, to the poets of the sweet new style from whom Dante himself developed. Uh, so he was a formidable figure, uh, however anonymous he is to us today. The, uh, the, the development of the sonnet, however, is generally credited to him. And it was a, uh, it was a fairly simple structure as he came up with it. Uh, two quatrains, Quatrains, four lines, two of them, of course, equal eight. Um, two quatrains followed by a uh, uh, by two tercets, or a sestina. Tercet is three, sestina then is six. A uh, fairly simple rhyme scheme, usually some variation of A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, C, B, C, D, C, D. Uh, obviously, variations on that flourish almost immediately, but always with that sense of a structured rhyme scheme. They're, they're not going to get too freeform with this. There was, there was some uh, fidelity to the idea of form. And the sonnet itself proved to be very flexible in that, especially within, uh, within Italian. The, uh, the language has a certain flow and natural um, iambic and, uh, and rhyming capacity that is very difficult to, uh, to match in other languages. Um, usually, uh, usually they, uh, these come in uh, the so-called head hendecasyllabic uh, line. Uh, for those of you who don't know what hendecasyllabic is, well, good for you. Uh, nobody really does. No, it means 11-syllable line, uh, which is a fairly conversational little rhyme as you go along. 11 syllables, and usually the, the, there's a stress that comes on the penultimate syllable, the next to last. So it gives a certain rhythm to it as you go along. And generally this evolves into uh, the iambic uh, tradition that you see, especially when, uh, when, it hits, uh, when it hits English, which is gonna do all other different things with the, uh, with the form. Uh, but the, uh, the idea of it is that the first quatrain introduces a problem. Uh, the drama of, of the poem, if you will. And the second quatrain, the second four lines, develops that a little bit, gives you a little bit more investment into it, gives you a little bit more uh, uh, depth into the problem itself. Uh, and then the sestet then shifts, and it begins with what it's known as a volta, which is a turn or a twist, um, a kind of shock, if you will, uh, if you prefer to think of that, a volta, uh, but it's it changes and it uh, then it starts to reflect on the problem. It has stated the problem and now it's going to consider the problem and perhaps propose a solution, usually leading to a deeper understanding of the poet and or the problem as two separate but somehow unified unities, entities, whatever. Uh, that can get a little abstract, that can get a little abstruse, but these are the basic functionings of the sonnet as it has come down to us. Um, and you can see this in, uh, in, uh, in Lentini's work. One of the most, uh, I, well, I don't know if you can say one of the most popular, but one, one work that is still with us that uh, that that we still have uh, is uh, a uh, the the poem Io Maggio posto in core a Dio servire, uh, servire uh, which is a nice little uh, sonnet in Italian that uh, that um, demonstrates all of these different uh, characteristics. 
what we uh, what we have, and it's helpful to look at it in the original Italian. What we have here is you can see a very simple rhyme scheme. Um, it is A B A B A B A B C D C D C D. A uh, very simple, very predictable, very cookie cutterish almost. Uh, but give him credit for if he's be, you know I don't know that this is the first sonnet he ever wrote. Um, but this, uh, certainly, you know, as, as helping set the form, this is a significant, uh, variation of it or, or iteration of it, not even a variation. Uh, but it's a very simple rhyme scheme, relatively, you know, simple 11 syllable lines. Uh, and, uh, and it has that volta, that turn that you can in the Italian really hear and not just, you know, conceptualize as, okay, it's a turn, as in the poem itself starts doing something differently, but it, uh, it has an oral quality that is easy to detect in the language itself. Um, and the poem itself is very nice. Uh, Io maggio posto in coria, a Dio servire, con mio potesse gire in paradiso, Al santo loco cagio odito dire, o si mantien solazzo gioco e riso, sanza madonna non vivoria gire, quella che ha bionda testa e clara viso, che sanza le non potere guardare, estando dalla mia donna diviso, ma non la dico, a tale intendimento, perché piccato ci volesse fare. Se non vede lo suo bel portamento e lo bel viso, il morbito sguardare, che quel miteria in gran cos, consolamento, vedendo la mia donna in gioia stare. Now, uh, a translation by, uh, by Freda Jensen you can find. I have set my heart on serving God so that I may go to paradise, to the holy place I have heard people speak about, where pleasure, joy, and merriment never cease. Without my lady, I would not want to go there, the one who has blonde hair and a shining brow. For without her, I could not have any joy. Being separated from my lady, but I am not saying that this would, but I am not saying this with the intention that I might want to commit a sin there, but only in order to see her dignified bearing and the beautiful face and the sweet gaze, for I would consider it a great consolation, a great consolation beholding my lady standing in glory. Yeah, so that's nice. Uh, a very, uh, very, you know, devotional poem, uh, religious in context. Uh, you can see a little bit of the court poetry uh, politics going on there because he is declaring his love for his lady uh, and his devotion to her. But it's a very uh, respectful uh, approach to the lady. It is certainly he doesn't want to do anything uh, inappropriate. He doesn't want to do anything sinful. Um, and, and all he wants to do is look at her. Now, this is very much in keeping with, let's say, the uh, uh, Art of Courtly Love by Andreas Capolanus. The rules of courtly love, where, uh, where you are not supposed to be, it is not supposed to be necessarily a, a physical love, but it is supposed to be a kind of devotion, and then you devote yourself to the lady as almost a an intermediary to devoting yourself to God, uh, and they are supposed to be seen as one and the same. So here, you can see the poet very tepidly saying, "Well, okay, you know, uh, I I would want to be able to see my lady there because I am so devoted to her, but uh, you know, uh, nothing, nothing, no funny business, no no fooling around." Now that's also a sign of some politics because, of course, in a court, uh, in a royal court, there, there are a number of ladies sitting around and you are expected to write poems in, in their honor, but also sitting around are probably their husbands. 
uh, marriage was a somewhat different institution at the time, especially in the, uh, the aristocracy. It was largely a financial arrangement, but that, uh, that uh, sense of proprietorship is pretty much uh, eternal with that. And he's going, the poet here is clearly trying to walk that fine line between being devoted to his lady, but not wanting to get crosswise with her powerful husband. So you can see all that going on. Uh, but also just, you know, notice a few things. Uh, notice again, the simple rhyme scheme, the simple predictable little flow of the rhyme scheme. It is a neat organized structure that, uh, that, uh, that presents a kind of neat and organized orderly universe. Um, a universe where, okay, God has structured the world in a very logical frame. Uh, that is, you know, the, the construction of, uh, of the universe a, uh, in, a, in an organized fashion is a very uh, medieval concept, a medieval theology of great precision and uh, the, the great working of a, of a universe. But you also see that, uh, that the mind of man here is able to replicate to a certain degree a kind of order on the page. Uh, the, the belief that, okay, humanity can create its own kind of order on the page in the form of art. And here we have a new form of art in the sonnet. And you can see that just in the, uh, the way this poem plays out. But also, again, look at the volta. Uh, ma non lo dico a tale intendimento. That marks the beginning of the sestet, the second half or second, I don't know, whatever, the, the second part of the, uh, of the poem. I'm not sure about doing the math. Ma non lo dico. Nice, simple, monosyllabic, punctuated, percussive sounds. Ma non lo dico. Compare it to the line just before it. Those lines before it, preceding it, have been very flowing, uh, often quite polysyllabic. Che uh, sanza le non poteri guardare, estando dalla mia dono diviso, ma non lo dico, ma non lo dico, but, ma, Italian for but, that little twist, that little turn, that little shock, Things are different now. Ma non lo dico. It turns right there. It's a nice, short, tight turn, and it starts to comment on the problem. It starts to qualify it, saying, now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to do anything uh, untoward. I don't want to do anything uh, unrespectable. Um, this is a slight twist, and it takes you inside the poem's thoughts a little bit. What you're getting is a kind of stream of consciousness as this lays out, and it creates a, a little drama in that because you are brought into the poems, the poet's thoughts as they happen, it seems. The idea is it is a very realistic, um, human-centered uh, art form because it creates or doesn't create it uh it mimics if you will uh the the process of human thought it is very natural in the way that it goes through it says something and then it starts to double back on it and reconsider it which brings you inside the process which gives you an idea that okay this is the human mind functioning this is human uh reality and a kind of celebration of rationality, but it is a uh, a, a particular uh, a, a particular representation of human consciousness organizing the world in real time, uh, and that is a great development in developing, quite frankly, the Renaissance. You couldn't have the Renaissance without that belief that human beings could suddenly be capable of uh, understanding something or be able to develop a complex thought. And here we're getting that. We're being brought into the process. Uh, Lentini's work uh, is, uh, is 
by and large considered uh, fairly conventional for its time, um, with this one exception. The sonnet is his legacy. The sonnet is rightly or wrongly, maybe he's taking credit for somebody else's work, nobody knows, doesn't really matter, but the sonnet as a artistic form is his gift to the next generation of writers who will take it, take it up and develop it and give us Petrarch in the generation following, and then from Petrarch it runs wildfire throughout the Renaissance all the way around the Western 